Greetings, Boogie fans! Michael here, and over the course of Pokemon's history, a lot of positive changes have been implemented into the games. Some that stand out to me are the physical special split in Gen 4, TMs no longer breaking in Gen 5, and the removal of HMs in Gen 7. However, there have been some changes that I didn't like. There's not many, but I was able to think of 10 that I'm going to list off in this video. Some of these are pretty universally disliked changes, but some are more specific to me. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel, and let's start with number one, Surf's change in targeting. My first Pokemon game ever was Pokemon Ruby, so an important piece of context that that brings is that double battles have been a part of my Pokemon experience since the start. Additionally, Ruby was still in the age of HMs, which meant that the water type on my team always knew Surf. Literally always, no exceptions, just like my flying type knowing Fly. The other HMs I could go fetch when needed, but Fly and Surf were used so often, especially in Hoenn with all of its water, that I felt like I needed those moves at all times. I would structure my team in such a way to make sure my water and flying types could learn them. Plus, both Surf and Fly are pretty strong moves, so not only were they used for traversal in the overworld, they were the primary attacking move for my water and flying types. In the double battles I would encounter in Gen 3, I would often utilize my water Pokemon for those battles, because Surf would hit both enemy Pokemon for great damage. The most consistent situation I would use the move in was against Tate and Liza to obliterate their Solrock and Lunatone, plus Claydol if it was Emerald. I enjoyed having the freedom to do that. Then came Pokemon Diamond, and on my team I had a Floatzel, which of course knew Surf. I played through normally, happened upon a double battle, clicked Surf, and damaged my other Pokemon. Excuse me? Between generations three and four, Surf was changed from impacting the two enemy Pokemon in a double battle to the two enemy Pokemon and the ally Pokemon, like Earthquake. It was no longer practical to use it in double battles unless the ally had some way of avoiding it or protecting, which was not the case for most of my team since double battles are so infrequent in playthroughs. So the main attacking move for all of my water type Pokemon for many generations became basically useless in double battles, when in Gen 3, it was excellent in double battles. Plus, there's an additional extra kick in the pants, which is Muddy Water. Muddy Water is a move that is identical to Surf, except it trades lower accuracy for the chance to lower the opponent's accuracy. The move even looks the same, except Muddy Water has brown water. Yet for some reason, Muddy Water still to this day only hits the enemy Pokemon while Surf hits the ally. That makes no sense. Why were they not both changed? Thankfully, Gen 7 removed HMs and therefore Surf was no longer necessary on my water type. So I could use Liquidation or Scald just fine in double battles. However, for the generations between three and seven, not being able to use my main water attack in double battles was very annoying, and I wish Surf had just kept targeting just the enemy Pokemon. Another move-related change that I didn't like was number two, the removal of using moves outside of battle. Now, I know what you're thinking, that seems to contradict with me just saying that the removal of HMs was a good thing. To clarify, I'm not talking about mandatory overworld moves, I'm talking about optional ones. When Sun and Moon came along and HMs were permanently replaced by Ride Pokemon, the Pokemon community rejoiced. No longer did our team's movesets have to be partially taken up by often inferior moves, nor did we have to use an entire party slot for an HM mule. However, when they removed these mandatory overworld moves, they also removed the optional ones that could make your life a bit easier. The ones that I'm specifically talking about are Dig and Teleport. Prior to Generation 7, Dig could be used to quickly escape from not only caves, but also sometimes buildings. It functioned as an infinite use escape rope, and it was quite nice to have to get out of any sticky situations deep in a cave. The move itself was also pretty good in battle, especially considering that most ground types don't learn Earthquake until later levels, so you could use Dig for a large portion of the playthrough. As for Teleport, it was a very useful precursor to Fly, 
allowing you to instantly warp back to the last Pokemon Center you visited. It is strictly inferior to Fly, but it's nice to have for the portion of the playthrough before getting Fly. Since my team was usually incomplete by the time I got access to Fly, I would often toss a Ralts or an Abra onto my team just for the use of Teleport, to be able to get back to the Pokemon Center much quicker than if I didn't have it. But then in Gen 7, Ride Pokemon replaced the HMs, but did not replace these optional moves. The only way to escape a cave is by using an escape rope, an item you have to spend money on, and there is no teleport replacement. Prior to getting the Charizard Ride or the Secret Technique Skydash, you just have to run back. Sword and Shield solved the dig and teleport problem by making the escape rope an infinite use key item and by making the Corviknight Taxi available very early in the game. However, during Gen 7, there were quite a few times where I was really missing the option to use dig or teleport. Another negative change that came up in Generation 7 was number three, bad shiny sparkles. In generations two through six, the sparkles that occur when a shiny Pokemon enters battle are tasteful. They vary in exactly how they appear, but they are generally the same. Several tiny sparkles fluttering around the Pokemon, bringing attention to its different appearance without stealing the show entirely. They accent the shiny Pokemon very nicely. But then in Gen 7, both the Alola and the Let's Go games, the shiny sparkles were changed to the ugliest ones out there. The sparkles are basically one giant star that completely covers up the shiny. Something personally relevant to myself and other Pokemon YouTubers is that it ruins the screenshot potential for these shinies. In older gens, you can get a screenshot with the sparkles around, it looks really nice, but this, it's like mid-sparkle, the star covers up the whole shiny. I know this isn't a huge deal, it's just an aesthetic thing that shows up for like a second at a time, but hey, I said these were changes that I did not like, not changes that everyone would care about. Thankfully, Sword and Shield remedied the bad sparkle issue, so we're back to nice looking sparkles for Generation 8. However, in Gen 7, the generation I did the most shiny hunting in, the sparkles suck. The next entry also has to do with shiny Pokemon, that being number four, not having a fun new shiny hunting method. For the last several generations, each new generation has implemented some kind of fun new shiny hunting method to substantially increase the odds of finding a shiny, alongside the Masuda method. Some examples are the Pokey Radar in Gen 4, Chain Fishing in Gen 6, SOS Battles in Gen 7, and Catch Comboing in Let's Go. Sword and Shield technically continued this trend, with the method being the Number Battled method. It's a pretty straightforward process. All you have to do is defeat or catch a lot of the same species of Pokemon, thus increasing its Number Battled value in the Pokedex. Doing so increases both your chances of finding a Yellow Aura Brilliant Pokemon, but also your chances of finding that species as shiny. First off, the increased odds are just not good enough. They are not worth your time. To get odds that matched the Masuda method, you have to KO or catch 500 of just one species of Pokemon to get better odds for just that one species. The Masuda method, you have those excellent odds right off the bat with any Pokemon you want. That is lame as hell, since most shiny hunting methods have better odds than the Masuda method, they just work on fewer Pokemon. For example, chain fishing can get you substantially better odds than the Masuda method, but you're limited to only fishing Pokemon in exchange. So not only is the number battled method bad by design from the start, it also doesn't even work. A bug in the code of Sword and Shield makes it so these better odds you reach only occur a small percentage of the time, capping out at a mere 3%. That means that, assuming you have the shiny charm, battling 500 of one species of Pokemon increases your odds for that one species from the base shiny charm odds of 1 in 1,365 to about 1 in 1,300, assuming I did my math right. That is a minuscule improvement that is still nowhere near as good as the Masuda method, so using the number battled to shiny hunt is literally a waste of your time. And as some more salt in the wound, this bug has been around since the games came out in November. I am filming this video in May of 2020. It's been six months since release, and they haven't patched this. 
Man, Game Freak is really sometimes unacceptably slow with patching their games. Animal Crossing had some bugs at launch and they fixed it in like two weeks. Come on, Game Freak, be more like Animal Crossing. The end result of all this is that the only worth your time shiny hunting method in Sword and Shield is the Masuda method, which for me is painfully dull and has killed my interest in shiny hunting. This dramatic change from the catch combo method in Let's Go, which was the game that I had the most fun shiny hunting in ever, to a method that may as well not exist is a dramatic change that I am very not happy about. Now, while I loved the shiny hunting in Let's Go, there was a change that those games brought that I was not happy about. That being number five, the Let's Go stat system change. In most main series games, Pokemon can gain extra points to certain stats by gaining effort values or EVs. There's a limit to how many you can give a Pokemon, that limit being 510, but functionally 508 since EVs have to be done in multiples of four to do anything. Every four EVs in one stat corresponds to one additional stat point for that Pokemon at level 100. This system has been a staple of the main series games for generations, and it's a massive part of the competitive battling community because a big part of the strategy is determining how you distribute your Pokemon's EVs. But then Let's Go came along and it implemented several drastic changes from the rest of the main series. The catching system was completely changed, as you likely know, but the battle system was also heavily simplified. Abilities and held items were removed, and effort values were replaced with awakening values, also known as AVs, and AVs are so dumb. One AV corresponds to one extra stat point at any level, and you get some AVs by leveling up, but the bulk of AVs come from feeding the Pokemon candy. One of its species candy increases all of its AVs by one, but you can only use species candy on Pokemon in the same evolutionary line. You can also use stat-specific candies, but they require more for each point the higher you get. A Pokemon has a limit of 200 AVs in every stat, so 1,200 total. That means there's no strategy whatsoever with how you distribute them, because you're just incentivized to give a max of 200 AVs in all of the stats for a Pokemon. So instead of being like EVs, where it's a strategic way to figure out how you distribute them, AVs you just give as many as possible to your Pokemon. They're pointless. So pointless, in fact, that if you do an online PvP battle against another person and you select normal rules, AVs are removed. Why do they exist? I'll tell you why, to make the playthrough even easier than it already is. AVs can be applied to a Pokemon at any level if you use the species candy. So if you give a level two Pidgey 200 Pidgey candy, it will have over 200 in every stat at level two. I will admit that's kind of hilarious, but it's also very broken and pretty dumb. I get that Let's Go is more heavily aimed at much younger kids than the rest of the main series, but this stat system to me is just, it just seems pointless. Why is it even there? So Let's Go did shiny hunting right, the stat system wrong, and following Pokemon very right. That's actually the focus of my next entry, that being number six, the removal of following Pokemon. Following Pokemon were first introduced in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and I don't think a single person exists who disliked this feature. It added so much to the immersion and connection with your team, since seeing your Pokemon wandering the world itself was not something you could previously do. Then they removed the feature, and I don't really think there's an excuse for doing it in black and white since the games were still in 2D, but with the 3DS games, I kinda get. They were doing 3D for the first time and the 3DS was a pretty underpowered console, and so having walking and running animations for every Pokemon in the game, I can get why that would be tough to implement. But then Let's Go brought following Pokemon back and it was fantastic. They looked so good in 3D, and the variety in how they traversed added so much personality to each Pokemon. Some zipped ahead, some lagged behind, some rolled instead of walking, and some you could actually ride. It was incredible. Many fans, including myself, hoped that the overworld encounters and the following Pokemon from Let's Go would be new mainstays in the series. Then Sword and Shield came out and overworld encounters were there, but following Pokemon 
were not. I really don't think there is any excuse for this. As I mentioned in the 3DS games, they would have had to code in a Pokemon, all Pokemon, being able to walk or run around in the overworld, something that did not occur in the vast majority of the games. But in Sword and Shield, almost every Pokemon is already in the overworld and has the running and walking animations coded in. Was it that hard to just add one more Pokemon to the overworld at any given time? I'm not a game dev expert, but I feel like they could have done that. So the removal of following Pokemon is a change that's happened twice now, and I have disliked it both times, so I desperately hope following Pokemon come back and then are never removed again. The next entry is another removal-based change, that being number seven, the removal of the PSS. The PSS, or player search system, was the interface for interacting with other players, and it is the best interface for doing so the main series has ever had. Want to trade or battle with a friend? Simply tap on their face and click trade or battle. The request then shows up in their game and they accept. You're done. You can do this at any location in your game. The interfaces since then have been garbage. Festival Plaza required you to go to Festival Plaza, which was stupid. And then Let's Go wouldn't even let you talk to specific friends. You just had to implement a certain Pokemon code. And then the Ycom in Sword and Shield does the same thing. In order to connect to a friend, you have to coordinate link codes and hope that no one else inputted the same one at the same time. The PSS was simple, intuitive, and effective. The removal of it was a giant mistake, and I desperately hope that the next online interface place in Pokemon is just like it. Just let me see a list of my online friends and tap on one and ask them to trade or battle. It is not hard. The next entry is number eight, the FPS downgrade. The generation three Pokemon games run at 60 frames per second and look so smooth. Every movement is fluid, and I personally think that's a big reason why my favorite mainline Pokemon graphics are the Gen 3 games. At least, they were prior to Sword and Shield, because Sword and Shield look incredible. But then in Gen 4, the games dropped to 30 FPS. Then in Gen 5, the battles were 60 FPS, but the overworld wasn't. Then every single mainline Pokemon game since then has run at 30 FPS. I am not a game development expert, and I don't want to pretend to be one, so I have no idea what all the back-end processes are that go into determining what frame rate a certain game runs at on a certain platform. However, I can still be disappointed with the change because I simply miss how smooth and good the games looked when running at 60 frames per second. Next up is number nine, the change to berry growth. Starting in Gen 3, the games I started in, berries were for the most part grown by planting one of that kind of berry, waiting some period of time, then picking the plant, which contains several of that kind of berry, a lot like growing fruit trees in Animal Crossing. I've mentioned it twice now, can you tell I've been playing it a lot? This method is a reliable way to obtain more of one specific berry that you want, because you plant that one berry and get more of that one berry. Every mainline game from Gen 3 to Gen 7, except the Gen 5 games, had a way to plant berries and grow more of the ones you want. While Gen 5 didn't have this method in the games, it had it in the Dream World, which isn't as good, especially since the Dream World is no longer available, but the option still existed. But then in Sword and Shield, they removed the ability to grow berries. The primary way to obtain more is by shaking berry trees and getting a random collection of them. If you want more of a specific type of berry, you have to go around to all of the berry trees that it can spawn from, shake the trees, and hope that you get some of them. And you can only shake a tree once per day. I experienced quite a bit of annoyance with this when I was trying to get a lot of EV reducing berries in Sword and Shield during the Metronome Battle Federation Season 2. I was trying to modify some of the EV spreads for some of my Pokemon. So to get more of the specific EV reducing berries for a certain stat that I wanted, I had to go around to all the trees that it spawned at, save my game, move my Switch's clock a day forward, then go back and check again and do that until I had enough. It was tedious and I didn't like it, and it would have been much more convenient if I could have just planted several of that specific berry and gotten them to grow. 
To be clear, I don't mind the berry trees themselves. I actually think the pseudo mini game involved with the risk versus reward, how many times you shake it and then a Pokemon attacks if you shake it too much, I think that's fun. However, I just don't like that there's no other way to grow more berries like there was in Gen 7. You could get the berries from the trees, but you could also grow more in Pokepelago. Sword and Shield should have had a method like that. And finally is number 10, the Gale Wings nerf. I love Talonflame a lot, so much so that not only is it my favorite regional bird, but it's also one of my all-time favorite Pokemon. A big reason why that is the case is because I had a ton of fun using it in Gen 6. I used a few different Talonflame, usually Choice Banded, to obliterate opponents with Priority Brave Bird. I used one to perform quite well in my first and only ever VGC tournament where I finished in the top 10% of 250 competitors, and I had a Talonflame on the team I used to get a 50 streak in the Battle Mason doubles. But I guess Game Freak didn't like Talonflame as much as I do, so in Gen 7, they nerfed its ability Gale Wings, the ability that made it so powerful, and they nerfed it way too much. Rather than always giving priority to flying moves, it only gives them priority when Talonflame has full health. This is an extremely severe nerf, so much so that it took Talonflame from one of the most powerful Pokemon in competitive to being in the lower tiers. If they wanted to nerf Gale Wings, fine. It was admittedly pretty OP, but making it so that it just doesn't work if Talonflame takes even one hit point of damage is too much. They should have made it so it only works if it has above half health or something like that. I really hate this severe Gale Wings nerf because it really hurt one of my all time favorite Pokemon. Thank you so much for watching and an extra special thanks to my patrons over on Patreon who are helping support my channel independent of pretty bad YouTube ad rates right now. If you wanna help support my channel in the same way, the link is in the description below. And if you wanna check out some more of my fun Pokemon content, I recommend these videos here. All right, that's all I have for now. So till next time, big fans, gotta catch them all.